Assassin's Creed The Film A massively expensive box office flop panned universally by critics and fans alike, despite the cast featuring the acting talents of Jeremy Irons and Michael Fassbender. Fans and critics alike pointed to its poor plot and pacing, lack of character development, and the way in which it did absolutely nothing to reach out to moviegoers who didn't play the games. It was a failure so massive that the franchise hasn't dared to go near the silver screen since. When the Assassin's Creed movie was announced, I was fresh off my first playthrough through Black Flag, and I was in big hype mode for the franchise in general, because Black Flag for its time was a very, very good game. When the film finally came out, I was dissuaded from watching it by literally everyone I spoke to who told me, Oh Lord Jesus, please don't watch it. This is possibly one of the worst films ever made based off a game, with people comparing it to the 1990s Mario film, which also flopped horrendously with both fans and critics. But let's get this show on the road and ask, was the Assassin's Creed movie really a disaster? The film begins with an opening text screen that explains some generalities of the plot. Sometimes this is okay to set the stage for a film, a la the opening of Star Wars. But in this case, as we shall see, it indicates some bad things are to come with the film's writing. Cue opening scene. We now pan to a kid who's riding a bike. Kid shows little disregard for fear of heights and he wears a hood. Yes, they do seem to be hinting at the fact that he's an assassin. Kid returns home. Assassin dad is standing next to dead mom. Templars show up. Kid is told to run. Kid runs. This opening scene is so full of little hints at the games that do virtually nothing to build the story. I can't imagine a worse way to set up a film for a general audience than to do this. I guess the kid is an assassin because in the opening scene he wears a hoodie and doesn't have a fear of height. It always amazes me what level of fanboyism do you want from us gamers to make these kind of connections and also enjoy them. You can literally feel the writers pitching the scene to themselves and thinking that it's really clever. And of course, we now skip to 30 years later to see what clever things they've got prepared for us now. The ginger kid, well, he's now on death row, and he's turned also into German-Irish actor Michael Fassbender. They execute him for murder. Well, who's murder? Who knows? But he's about to die. The film doesn't really care very much so far for the audience's sense of context, meaning, or why events might even be important. The end, he dies. He's woken up in Abstergo, and he's not happy about it, and so we get this interesting scene of Michael Fassbender desperately crawling on his belly to escape Abstergo. Now this is my definition of cinema. At this point, you might think from my summary that this is the first two minutes of the film, but no, 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 no. This is the first 16 minutes of the film. This is where we're at. One thing I've been picking up during a lot of my videos on gaming media is that lazy Hollywood writers like to think that us gamers are so nerdy that they'll use it as an excuse for poor storytelling. Like, you know, we as gamers will just fill in the gaps with the story in the way that they're supposed to be telling it to us. Like, let's recap so far what we've had over 15 minutes into this absolute gem of a movie. So far, we've seen an assassin, presumably his father because they're both ginger, a kid ride a bike, the same kid 30 years later be executed after what was presumably a life of crime and desperate alienation. The storytelling so far is identical to when young children go, and then... And then I did, and then he said. Now children do this because they have limited vocabulary and aren't aware of conventions that almost all languages have from Japanese to ancient Greek of, say, using the mythical present tense to tell stories. One can only ask what excuse the Hollywood Writers Guild seems to come up with time and time again. In fact, let's just stop a moment and talk about another action film, a favorite of mine, Top Gun. 15 minutes into Top Gun, we've seen some amazing footage of Jet that sets up the scene amazingly. An awesome dogfight that, through its dialogue, sets up the various personalities of the pilots that are involved in the rest of the film, and defines the imminent not-Russian threat. It also sets up an important subplot point for Maverick's romance by making him intimately familiar with the MiG-29 so that he can get intimately familiar with his significant other. We then see Cougar Panic, which shows the high level of stress these pilots are under and gives us some context. And it also sets up Cougar's failure to deal with that stress and Maverick's rise as those two characters are going to Top Gun. That sets up Top Gun. We've got the character dynamics, the future romance plot set up, and the looming setting of the Slukavilans. In less time than this film has taken me to show Michael Fassbender crawling on his belly desperately. 
When he's done desperately crawling, he eventually reaches a window and stares out from the upper floor of Abstergo HQ with some CGI that is kind of cool, but the pan out probably just left everyone in the cinema that hasn't played the games going, what? I'm all for fan service, but it would be really great if by now someone in the show said something. As we approach the 20 minute mark of the show, we have yet to have a full section of dialogue back and forth between two characters properly. Without much ado, our protagonist is jacked into the animus, and with a tad more exposition from Science Lady, that poor section of the audience that hasn't played an AC game is left completely befuzzled. As Michael Fassbender is sent back in time to relive a battle between his ancestors and the Templar, we now pan to some CGI footage of an eagle flying over medieval Spain. We're now over 20 minutes into the film. There's, again, no real plot characterization, and now we just have a combat scene. And it's a pretty good combat scene between the Assassins and the Templars, some nice parkour, some sword fighting. But the combat scene ends in a literal cliffhanger, one that causes Cal to desync with the Animus and be pulled out of the simulation. There's nothing to the scene other than some meaningless action. The action itself is fun, but action is supposed to forward the plot. This action does not do this. As he returns to the present, Cal is told that he did a good job, though at this point, again, the story hasn't provided any criterion for what him doing a good job would be. As his consciousness fades out, presumably from brain damage from the Animus, he sees the faint image of his ancestor from Spain walking towards him. I know I've been hard on some shows for having too much exposition, but this lack of exposition is absolutely on the other side of crazy things. This is not an avant-garde French cinematic masterpiece, despite having that French Bond girl and it using an Ubisoft IP. Some actual dialogue and characterization of the people involved in the story and its plot might be nice because we're getting to the 25 minute mark and I'm starting to feel insane. But pan camera. Jeremy Irons is sitting surrounded by Templar artifacts watching himself on TV address what is presumably some fictional version of the United Nations. Him and his daughter are having a disagreement about how to use the Animus with Cal. French lady who looked nothing or sounds nothing like her father wants to gain Cal's trust, while her father wants to push him as hard as possible. As her father attempts to do up his cufflink, it's not so subtly revealed that he has some sort of neurological disorder, probably some form of Parkinsonism from the shaking of his hand. But don't worry, nothing will happen with this plot point, I promise you. It's not relevant because what his daughter is in fact looking for is the cure for violence, not Parkinsonism. A line that is going to make even more zero sense to anybody that hasn't played an Assassin's Creed game before. Because all the normal audience in this film is seeing is two famous actors speaking absolutely gibberish in a drab, futuristic building. If you watch this film and you're not a fan of the Assassin's Creed games, my heart goes out to you. Now at this point, I thought they might be trying to add some tension. Perhaps the father is looking for a way to find some sort of immortality or healing, and he's pushing his daughter to find it, maybe she doesn't know that he's ill, and this is going to be a tension point throughout the rest of the movie. Maybe she realizes that she wants to save her dad, but she doesn't want to let him have the apple, and the family tensions add to the plot. Nope, that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen at all. Never happens. Nope, there, it's just dropped right here. You can tell the writers who wrote this film really thought they were clever because there are elements in the film that really show you just how seriously they're taking this. And you can see Ubisoft's French influence at times as well because you really do feel given the lack of, you know, things happening that this might be a French film. Nothing against the French, mind you. The odd mix of American style though and Hollywood French stare at the wall style dramatic cinema is just really jarring when it all comes together. And now at the 30 minute mark of the film, we finally get a bit of sustained dialogue. But is it something that kind of expands upon the plot and drives the story forward? No. It's the cringiest political rant, possibly, by the boss lady who oversees Jeremy Irons and his project. And she tells him that it's being discontinued. Because, and I quote, We have won. People no longer care about freedom. I swear to God, this dialogue is so cringy that were I not making this video, I would have turned off the film here at this point and stopped watching. As somebody that used to teach seminars in political philosophy for undergraduate university students, I have a very good ear and a strong stomach for undergraduate cringe political opinions, and I've got some immunity to listening to them. But this film is, ugh, I'm, I'm going to put it on. You can suffer too. Be fun. People no longer care about their civil liberties. They care about their standard of life. 
The modern world has outgrown notions like freedom. They're content to follow. For the Polish souls that were dragged to this film and weren't fans of Assassin's Creed, the plot here is finally explained about the relationship between the Templar and the Assassins and how the Templar are trying to control mankind and eliminate violence and the Assassins are presumably naturally violent people that are always disrupting society throughout history. They're also using Cal's ancestors to the surprise of no one to track down the apple, to find it in the present and to eliminate human freedom. Yay, the audience can finally latch onto this, but they were also just told that it's something the Templar don't even really need to do now because we're all too addicted to our smartphones to care about human freedom. It's also really rich being lectured on how much time we spend on digital entertainment by Ubisoft, I'm just saying. Meanwhile, Mr. Fassbender is having nightmares and it's explained to him that this is the bleeding effect from the regression in the Animus. At least by this point in the film, they've realized that they probably need to start explaining how some of this works to the audience. We're also briefly introduced to Omar from The Wire, who is an absolutely amazing actor and struggles to deliver this amazingly cringe line of dialogue. Give him a little more time, Amir. The man might prove to have some noble blood in him yet. You can literally see the pain on his face. What is so surprising to me as I watch this film and more of the cast are introduced to me is the incredible amount of acting talent all here in one film, all acting so poorly together. I can't tell if it's just how bad the script is or if there was some sort of cash grab involved with these actors all being paid much more than usual because it is a big name computer game or if perhaps there was some sort of drama between the actors with the director behind the scenes. But either way, the performances are awful. Fassbender's performance is particularly awful in light of his general skill as an actor. At times, I even struggled to believe it was him. I genuinely had to look it up to make sure I wasn't mixing him up with another sexy ginger British actor. Now back in the Animus, Cal finds himself as Aguilar, his ancestor once again, about to be executed by the Catholic Church. In fact, actually pause for one second. This will probably date the video, but as of writing this, Ubisoft are undergoing a massive controversy for having a black samurai in their latest Assassin's Creed game, Assassin's Creed Shadows. Can we just remember though for a second that this was the company that had a boss battle in Assassin's Creed 2 where you literally kicked the Pope to death? Who made the Catholic Church the boogeyman of literally every Assassin's Creed game that the historical context allowed for them to do so? I mean, it's not like conspiracy theories about Catholics have ever harmed actual people in ways that black samurai probably haven't. Replaying some of the Assassin's Creed games and watching this film, I can't believe that this is the first time after all these years the Assassin's Creed games have finally landed in historical controversy. But anyways, Back to the Inquisition, because in Assassin's Creed, everyone expects the Spanish Inquisition. We finally get to see consistent and amazing parkour scenes as Aguilar escapes his own execution. But as he escapes across the rooftops, Cal desyncs with his ancestor as his ancestor does the signature eagle dive maneuver, causing the Animus to collapse and disrupt. Cal begins to realize that this process is going to kill him. And he's told in response that the only solution, you know, the only way to not have his brain melt is to go back into the Animus under his own free will because it's his hesitation to jump off buildings that's holding him back. I feel like this is a very meta point with this film that in order to survive the events of the film, Cal needs to actually want to play Assassin's Creed in order to survive the film. Nice marketing, Ubisoft. At least his version is free of all DLC with no microtransactions, am I right? At this point, I'm beginning to realize why Fassbender is phoning in his lines. He must have taken one look at the final version of this script and gone, what? Because listen to the way he delivers this bit of dialogue. I'm here to be cured of violence. Who's gonna cure you? I swear to God, they either promised to pay him a lot for this film or something went wrong in the production between the actors. Who speaks like this? Nobody speaks like this. It sounds like it was written by an angsty teenager. This kind of dialogue belongs in a cheesy action flick at best. 
but yet this movie feels more like it's trying to sell itself as an artistic action film similar to the newer James Bond films. Certainly everyone else in the cast is known for serious dramatic performances. These are all stage actors with a solid background in theater. You know who actually would have been great in the role of Cal so far? Ryan Reynolds. He would have taken all these weird lines and made them work, but instead they cast a well-known Shakespearean. Clearly they just don't know what direction to take the film in. At this point, Jeremy Irons comes to Cal with a deal to stop him from desyncing in the Animus. But the plot sneakily doesn't tell us to build the suspense for a whole 30 seconds. Turns out his dad, played by Brendan Gleeson, like holy crap, they were actually trying to take this film seriously with the cast, is actually in the facility with him. They will let him murder his father in cold blood if he goes into the Animus and is willing to retrieve the data about the apple for them. Science lady is against this cruel act of murder, but her dad tells her to be prepared because Cal's going to do it because that's just the sort of violent ginger dude he is. But Cal doesn't do it, and instead opts to harm his father by pledging to ruin the Assassin's Creed by getting the apple for Abstergo. So it's back into the animus for Cal, after a pretty decent fight scene and some more parkour in which his ancestor watches his lover die and escapes with the apple. It's concluded by Abstergo that the apple was given to none other than Cristobal Colombo. Oh, speaking of lovers die, I forgot to mention that Cal's dad did in fact kill his own mother. That wasn't a trick. He killed his own mother so that she wouldn't be used in the animus. That's the thing that happened, by the way. Anyways, at this point, I was really struggling to continue with what remained of the film and by inference, the writing of this script. But at this moment, the film temporarily picks a pace and I gotta admit, I actually started to enjoy it. Speaking of enjoying things, if you've watched this far into the video, please click the like and subscribe button because it fuels the dopamine that I need to continue watching movies like this one. As Cal exits the Animus, now aware of the location of the apple, previous assassins appear before him, including his dead mother. He recites the Assassin's Creed to her and then decides to kick some Abstergo ass. As cheesy as it was, I do actually like the line from his mother about him never being alone. It ties in nicely to the fact that he'll now be fighting alongside the other assassins captured by Abstergo as they try and break free, but it also nicely ties into the idea of genetic memory and us being the sum of our ancestors' activity, this sort of genetic determinism. Like I said, the film takes itself really seriously, and this is the only bit of the film where that seriousness actually pays off in me, the audience, enjoying it. And you can tell that the actors felt the same way because suddenly Fassbender is doing that Fassbender thing where, you know, he acts really good. But just for these scenes, Science Lady and Scar escape the facility as it falls to the assassins in a pretty good combat scene. I mean, it's no John Wick, but it isn't bad either. But I must admit the combat scene does raise for me one question. I know Spain or wherever they are in Europe has gun laws, but Abstergo are presumably an illegal organization. I'm pretty sure they can have some guns. The AC combat style isn't meant in an age where people have semi-automatic weapons, but anyways, the guards kind of lose out because, you know, they're fighting assassins in hand-to-hand -hand combat, because they are. Flash forward a few days, and now we're in merry old London. Now, those of you who aren't Londoners like me will recognize the building that features as the Templar Hall. It's the Masonic Lodge HQ for all the Freemasons in the United Kingdom. Pretty sure they didn't get permission from the Masons to use the street shot for that purpose. I love how they managed to mix both conspiracy theories about Masons and Catholics together, especially when the two are historical enemies and generally have been the two groups sharing the conspiracy theories about each other. But hey, it's not like Ubisoft's attempts to bend history will ever catch up with them as a company, right? Right? Anyways. The surviving assassins sneak into the lodge, Omar from The Wire included, and kill Scar and take the apple back. Cal leaves the daughter alive after confronting her and giving her the choice to allow the murder of her father in order to stop him using the apple for his nefarious purposes. It turns out that he didn't care much about world peace after all, which is weird because when her father wanted to use the apple to mind control mankind into subservience, she thought it was bad. But when he wanted to use it to eliminate violence by mind controlling all mankind and subservience, it was good. I mean, aren't those kind of the same thing? Either way, it's apple based genetic mind control. Not sure the writers thought this through. We all know the real reason, though, that she lives is because the writers of this film were delusional enough to think that this script was ever going to get a sequel. 
She vows revenge over the corpse of her father's body, and the camera pans out now to catch Cal, now in full-on modern assassin garb, standing on top of the London skyline. The end. Well, that sucked. My takeaways from the film are threefold. Two are about the film and the other is more generally about the Assassin's Creed franchise and watching the film a decade after it came out. The biggest flaw in the film is the direction of its storytelling. It's got everything the wrong way around about the Assassin's Creed franchise. The story in Assassin's Creed is a historical drama with a sci-fi framing. What do I mean by this? Well, in the games, what I remember from the important plot is what was captured in each historical narrative. That is what happened to the historical protagonist of the game. The present day events in the game frame the context of the story for me and allow me to connect with the lore and the franchise more broadly. However, the film, however, gets this entirely the wrong way around. It uses the history to frame the present day sci-fi story. By giving that story context, and then uses the modern day setting and its protagonist as the core narrative. This doesn't work. This makes the Assassin's Creed franchise into something it isn't. It makes it a sci-fi kung fu dystopian drama similar to The Matrix, rather than a work of historical fiction with some aliens and Pope beating thrown in for good measure. It's the exact kind of phenomenon The Matrix films come into when they're more based outside of The Matrix than, you know, inside The Matrix, which is the locus of the plot and the storyline. This connects with the second problem within the film. It takes itself far, far too seriously for its subject matter. Assassin's Creed, the games can get away with this because they focus on a quasi-historical past that most normal people won't spot all the weird historical inaccuracies with and thus won't have their immersion ruined. In fact, with the release of the original Assassin's Creed as someone interested in history, the remakes of those major cities in the Levant were amazing and very immersive. This doesn't apply in a modern setting. Seeing my old London neighborhood turned into a Tiplar dystopia looks jarring, weird, and at times borderline culturally insensitive. And this gets to the third point. I'm not sure in 2024 whether we should still be producing the Assassin's Creed franchise. There was a time for the edgy humor of the early noughties where games where you punch the Pope and meet ancient aliens were cool. Ubisoft has long been on the edge of going both too far in left-wing and right-wing conspiracy theories to fuel interest in their games and their pseudo-histories, along with a healthy helping of stereotyping in these IPs and others such as Far Cry. I'm not going to go into a full political rant about the current Assassin's Creed Shadows drama, but watching this film really made me look back at a lot of things about the Assassin's Creed series and the way it's treated history, from its portrayal of religions like Islam and Catholicism that dates back to an era where people thought Richard Dawkins was cool, as well as its often stereotyped portrayal of indigenous peoples in Far Cry and the Assassin's Creed franchise. Watching this film and thinking about my love for the Assassin's Creed franchise over 17 years of playing these games, in the end I feel like a black samurai really has been a long time coming. In 2024, I think we can no longer stomach the kind of Dan Brown historical fiction that used to make the Assassin's Creed franchise kind of fun. Because watching this film in 2024, it just feels like a lot of cringe Dan Brown historic fiction. If you watched this far in the video, do give me a like and subscribe. I'm going to be making more videos like this that are sort of deep dives into gaming media more broadly, video and TV. And if you actually did watch this far, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the next video.